we're ready. Take it away. Okay, cool. Everyone, you can hear me good. Let me just take you out of full screen. I'm just going to share my slides. Can I get a thumbs up if that's all good? You can see that. Awesome. Awesome. All right, cool. It's nice to see everybody. Thanks so much. Um, shame I can't be there with you in person. Probably be a bit more of an interactive session. Um, but in the uh, wonders of modern technology means that we can have this little chat. As Naomi said, um, I've got a specific interest in new and more so new psychoactive substances. So things like um, synthetic cannabinoids and other synthetic drugs that are popping up on, on markets rapidly um, in recent years. Um, and I've done a little bit of research in the space in terms of um, AOD workers capacity for responding to um, novel psychoactive use, whether people feel informed, they've got access to information, whether they think it's relevant to the cohorts that they work with, things like that. Um, and the answer is yes, they did think it was relevant and no, they didn't think that the information available was um, uh, adequate. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that. One being, obviously, there's always a lag between new drugs coming onto the market and then, um, you know, starting to see maybe emergence of patterns of use and harms. Um, and then there's a lag for the sector to be able to catch up. So hopefully we can close some of those gaps. It's going to be a pretty superficial um, uh, overview today for you guys, um, only that we don't have a lot of time. But what I will do is point you in the direction of uh, more information and where, where the emerging information or the best information is available, um, as far as we know, um, and we'll go from there. So obviously before I kick off, or before I, I should have, before I kicked off, who's obviously acknowledged the traditional owners um, of the land. So I'm currently sitting on Wurundjeri land in Melbourne, um, pay respects to elders past, present and emerging, and obviously extend that respect to uh, all First Nations people, either in our communities or that we work with or who are joining us today. Um, yeah, so a quick overview, going to give you a bit of an outline of what's going on. Um, uh, definitions and backgrounds about new psychoactives. I could talk about that for ages. I could do a whole hour on that, but unfortunately we don't have time. Um, and get into hopefully launch quickly into the nitty gritty, which is more about what the common classes of new substances are that we're seeing and the ones that probably have most relevance in terms of the cohorts that you guys are working with. Um, because they're new, I'm going to stress this over and over again, because they're new substances, we don't have a lot of research about um, their effects in human consumption. But from the research, uh, so, so we don't know a lot about in um, specific substances and their dependence potential and or withdrawal, but um, I will highlight key groups of, and categories of substances that might have uh, a particularly unique withdrawal syndrome and or uh, dependence potential. And then just a little bit about the best ways to respond um, in terms of working with clients and, and as a sector and maybe some more systemic stuff as well. Um, time permitting, we'll talk a little bit more about um, maybe some emerging substances. So those substances that aren't necessarily new, but we're starting to see new patterns of use and or um, patterns of harm, um, potentially, oh, something's happened there on my slide, but potentially um, drugs that were once considered party drugs like ketamine and GHB that we're starting to see new patterns of use and pregabalin, which is Lyrica, which um, uh, is a non-opioid um, analgesic that we're starting to see um, some pretty nasty harms coming out of. And as I said, I'll point you in the direction of um, more info. So unless anyone's waving at me, I've got you all in a very small corner of the screen. So Naomi, jump in if I'm missing any questions that are popping up. And on that note, I want to welcome you guys to jump in if something I'm saying is not clear or doesn't align with what you're saying. Just um, happy to chit chat and, and let questions guide where the conversation goes, or you can just save it to the end and we can open up at the end um, for question time. So just give me a hoy if you want to jump in. Um, so, without further ado, oh, bear with me, I can't see what you're seeing actually guys, so that's going to be a bit awkward, so I might just refer back to the notes that I've got in front of me. Um, but in terms of what are new psychoactive substances, I'm going to use the term going to use the term new psychoactive and novel interchangeably. It's much easier to say NPS. Um, there's 
a lot of confusion in terms of the umbrella technology, what it covers. We certainly see that a bit, but by definition, technically, we're talking about synthetic or plant-based substances um, that often mimic the effects of traditional substances that we're familiar with, things like amphetamines, hallucinogens, cannabis, um, drugs like that. And they're known colloquially under a bunch of different terms, um, things like bath salts, legal highs, herbal highs, research chemicals, synths, um, designer drugs. And there's kind of a fair bit of confusion um, differentiating what people are referring to. Um, and some of these labels can be a little bit of misnomers, things like uh, legal highs can suggest that substances are legal when actually they may not be. Herbal highs can suggest things like they might be less harmful um, than, than other substances when actually herbal highs may have lots of research chemicals in them. Um, so because of all these misnomers around the different types of um, terminology that people are using, there's been a bit of standardisation of the language and that's where it's boiled down to new psychoactive substances. And it's been something that was adopted um, and brought into vernacular, I guess, uh, by the European Monitoring Centre for Drugs and Drug Addiction, as well as the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. And more recently, the Australian Government Intergovernmental Committee on Drugs has um, adopted that standardised terminology. So, even though there's no technical universally accepted definition, the one that we tend to use um, to give us a little bit of guidance on what we're actually talking about is the EMCDDA definition. And it is, uh, bear with me, any substance not controlled by the 1961 Convention on Narcotic Drugs or the 71 Convention on Psychotropic Drugs, but may pose a similar or comparable public health threat, similar to the illicit drugs that are controlled under those conventions. Um, however, it can get a bit murky in the research and in the literature and when we sort of use this umbrella technology because um, we often see a broadening of that definition to include drugs that are included under those inter, uh, international conventions, but um, we that, that have seen a recent emergence of use. So we tend to use the term NPS and emerging psychoactive substances interchangeably. And the emerging ones are things that are relatively new to recreational drug markets or we're seeing new patterns of use. So like I already said, um, and that might be things like 2CB, um, DMT, ketamine, things like that. Um, and it's probably worth pointing out that there's a bit of an issue in terms of, of, of categorising these groups and we'll get into how we categorise them a little bit more clearly um, down the track. But just to give you a background on what we do know rather than what we don't know about them, we know that um, since uh, in the last decade, since the United Nations have started um, an international reporting system that at least 900 new substances that we aren't familiar with um, have been identified globally. We're not sure exactly how many of those have been identified in Australia because the reporting system's pretty broad, but we know it's at least 100 to 200. So we're talking about a really vast range of, of, of substances. Um, even though population prevalence is really quite low for these substances, we have seen um, relatively alarming rates of acute and chronic harm starting to come to the surface, particularly with certain classes of these drugs, things like synthetic cannabinoids, um, obviously synthetic opioids, in the, particularly in the USA, not so much here. Um, and those rates of harm tend to be elevated in specific cohorts of people um, who we might consider more vulnerable people. Um, people like youth, homeless populations, forensic populations, um, people subject to drug testing, people who are experiencing comorbid mental health issues. And that might be around accessibility, price, availability of these substances, but it could also be potentially linked to um, things like uh, avoiding, avoiding drug detection in, in certain populations. So it can be problematic. Um, and in the limited data that we do have, we have sort of started to see that people who use these substances don't tend to use them exclusively. It's no big surprise that people who experience drug and alcohol related issues are, tend to be poly drug users. 
Um, but it does look like the people who are using these drugs at higher rates um, may actually um, be more prone to problematic substance use, things like dependence um, and, and acute harms. And as we said, higher rates in those vulnerable populations that it's really worth keeping in mind about. A couple of European researchers have done um, an analysis and identified there's massive gaps in the literature, which is no surprise. Um, certainly AOD and other community and health service workers report limited knowledge and access to information and because of that limited knowledge there's a lack of confidence. Something I want to drum home to you guys is that the knowledge that you already have about general drug um, effects and their interactions and managing withdrawal tends to be relevant to these classes of drugs. So at the moment there is no new psychoactive substance type um, or need for specific uh, treatment interventions. It's business as usual in most cases. Um, and I'll highlight the ones where it might be slightly different to what you'd expect. But essentially harm reduction is the primary intervention that we need to use with people. So it's about making people more aware of, of these substances and the risks um, associated with, with their use. Um, but hopefully we can build a little bit of confidence within the sector that existing drug knowledge is actually relevant um, and you guys know more than you probably give yourself credit for. So I don't want to spend too much um, time talking about prevalence of use uh, but I do want to point out that the Australian data is really limited. Realistically we only have the National Drug Strategy Household Survey, they've only been monitoring new psychoactives since about 2013, so we've only seen two surveys. We do see relatively low rates of use, as you can see in the, um, the graphs comparing um, synthetic cannabis use, which has been monitored separately to all other MPS. And we're looking at um, uh, lifetime use rates, you know, less than 3%. Um, there is no evidence, as I said, for unique cohorts just using these substances alone, um, but we are seeing higher rates of use in some regular drug using cohorts. So the other data, the monitoring systems that we have access to are the EDRS, which is the ecstasy related drugs reporting system, who are regular psychostimulant users, tend to use it what we would call risky rates. Um, and rates of NPS use tend to be about 30 to 45% in these these cohorts. These particular groups use synthetic cannabinoids a little bit less than other groups. Um, and just to get a snapshot of where Australia sits in terms of prevalence of use compared to the rest of the world, uh, the Global Drugs Survey shows that we're sitting a little bit higher than maybe the global population rates. And that might be related to how easy it is to export these substances into Australia. Um, and that we're far away from, from the rest of the world. Um, so I guess most importantly, what's the issue with them? We've got new chemicals emerging rapidly. Um, even though there's you know, more than 900 substances been identified, very few of these actually become established on drug markets. So again, when we get into the nitty gritties, we're gonna look at four or five main categories that are probably most relevant to the, um, to the AOD sector, certainly in Australia. Um, but the problem is we have no history of humans consumption. So the effects of these drugs are not particularly well understood and therefore the harms aren't well known. Um, and there's variability in terms of how people um, uh, process them and toxicity, independence and withdrawal can be really tricky to identify. identify. As I said, we're seeing increasing rates of um, acute and chronic harms, particularly in those vulnerable cohorts I've already mentioned. That's been evidenced here in Victoria through um, ambulance attendances. We've certainly seen a really big spike in people being admitted to emergency departments or experiencing um, ambulance call outs, uh, particularly for synthetic cannabinoid use, more so since about 2015. Um, and there's lots of other data emerging to suggest that, you know, there's a really significant issue there. Um, our monitoring systems are not particularly good. Europe has a really great uh, monitoring systems and early warning systems about drug, drug trends and, and drug use, but we're not as good as that here in Australia. Um, 
bar you know the handful of surveys that we do have access to so that means that we don't have a really good understanding of who's using them and why people are using them but I've already touched on some of those reasons um, it seems to be they're quite they can be quite cheap they can be very cheap to produce um, and therefore cheap to on sell often they can be used as fillers in other substances so there's an added complication where people may be using them unintentionally um, but we're definitely seeing um, data emerging from Europe and anecdotal data locally, uh, certainly elevated rates of synthetic cannabinoid use, particularly in homeless populations, forensic populations, and in um, people who are uh, more likely to be drug tested in the workplace and mental health populations. Legislation about them is pretty ambiguous. It varies from state to state. Currently here in Victoria, uh, there is a psychoactive substances ban that came into effect two years ago, which means it's illegal to produce, sell, promote any substances that have any psychoactive effect whatsoever, regardless of their chemical makeup. Um, that legislation has removed these drugs from shop fronts and made maybe some of the accessibility and perceptions of their legality uh, has reduced that a little bit. Um, but what it's done is it's sort of complicated the water. People still consider them legal highs, herbal highs, and potentially less safe. Um, and that can be really problematic. And that varies from state to state too. So there, that, there's something to consider there in terms of um, talking to clients about harm reduction if people think that they're carrying substances that are not illegal, but actually potentially they, they may be and there's implications there. We also know that um, people who use these substances may not necessarily be your typical AOD presenting cohorts. Um, so there's an engagement issue there where we need to start talking to people more about, about their substance use and what substances are available out there. So there's a whole myriad of issues that means that, um, uh, you know, there's a legitimate public health concern going on around these substances. Um, and as I said, sort of just talking about them overarchingly can be a little bit problematic um, because certainly in the research that we did earlier this year, we did see that there was sort of, depending on the, the workers that we spoke to and the cohorts that they worked with, when we said NPS, they may have been thinking of maybe synthetic cannabinoids, they might have been thinking about uh, stimulants um, and certainly there was a group of people people who are thinking very specifically about synthetic opioids. So it's kind of important to break down the um, classifications so we understand them a little bit, a little bit more. Um, so a helpful way, obviously, that we tend to classify substances in the AOD sector is obviously um, based on their central nervous system effects. And if you have a look at this little uh, infographic that may not be particularly clear to you, but I've given you a link and maybe sent a copy of it in PDF to Naomi, um, which breaks, breaks different groups of the new substances and chemical strains that sort of fall into the standard grouping of stimulants, hallucinogens, cannabinoids. Um, um, and depressants and synthetic cannabinoids get their own category because they are a really unique type of substance. Um, so most MPS can be slotted into those categories based on their effects and in terms of managing them clinically, um, both in acute and, and, and other healthcare settings, um, it's really useful. Um, Another classification system that's sort of more recently emerged is this drugs wheel, which sort of teases out those, um, those categories even further. So stimulants can be broken up into empathogens, hallucinogens are sort of broken up into psychedelic types, which tend to have more um, stimulant type effect together with associ and separating out dissociatives like ketamine and other substances. Um, so that's just a new way of classifying things that can be a little bit more descriptive and a little bit more specific. And the ADF, just to point you guys in their direction, the ADF have recently, whoops, sorry, apologies, jumped ahead, have recently put together this really great interactive drugs wheel, which will tell you what class different substances fall into and or what novel psychoactives that um, are emerging uh, what classes they then fall into. So that can be a really useful tool for getting more info. So I'm going to launch into the specifics um, 
And as I said, if there's any questions that pop up, please, please do jump in or write them down and ask later. Um, so synthetic cannabinoids are a really interesting category of groups. They're a new substance. They were originally designed to mimic the effects of normal THC, the psychoactive component, obviously, um, in cannabis. Um, they were originally designed to produce that similar effect and been sold online since about 2004. They made a really big surge in Australia in WA, were quite popular in the mining industry because they were functionally similar to THC, but they couldn't be detected in drug testing. Um, however, and they were quite, an, uh, quite similar, functionally similar to, to normal cannabis. What then happened um, is uh, different strains of these synthetic cannabinoids started to get banned um, as the government received pressure from mining industry and people became more aware of them. Um, and then what has evolved are these different strains of what's called synthetic cannabis, but actually could be any research chemical soaked onto any plant material um, and sold. So they may or may not have any functionality that's like THC at all. Um, and certainly many of the newer strains of synth cannabinoids tend not to have um, any of the other cannabinoids in them that temper the effects, the psychedelic effect that THC may or may not have. The other issue with them is because um, they're obviously not regulated, the strength can vary from batch to batch. It can e even vary um, very significantly in one dose. Um, depending on how the substance is sprayed onto the plant material. Um, and because they can be any kind of research chemical, when combusted and smoked, they can be really volatile and really irregular in action. So even in one batch that somebody buys, they may have a very different effect from you know, one pipe to the next, um, depending on how, they mull, how evenly they mull it up and or use the substances. So even though population rates are very really quite low, um, we are sort of starting to see some really nasty side effects. Um, and they're side effects that are very unique than what you would see with normal cannabis. Um, so things like, things that tend to mimic what you might actually see with stimulants rather than cannabinoids, which is, which is a strange thing in itself. So we're starting to see psychological and neurological effects, really intense anxiety, but anxiety that escalates to agitation and paranoia. Sometimes psychosis and seizures have also occurred. We're seeing people having serious cardiovascular issues. Um, another unique side effect that we're sort of starting to see is people may suffer very long periods of really upset um, gastrointestinal issues, nausea, vomiting, cramping that can go on for days and days, and that can sort of um, um, escalate when all the other symptoms are happening concurrently. So the take home message really is that the effects and the risk profile of these substances is really, really unique to cannabis. Um, and in terms of withdrawal, it's been reported from people that the withdrawal is really unique as well. So we start to see people going into withdrawal um, quite quickly within two days of use and that withdrawal can come with quite high risk of seizure. So if somebody you're working with is using synthetic cannabinoids, um, it's really strongly advised that withdrawal should be done in a residential or at least a very heavily um, monitored situation because of these unique risks. Um, and if you know, a residential facility isn't available. I'm get, I know you guys are regional um, and that may not be possible. Certainly there's a level of medical management and observation that needs to happen. Um, and like I said, some of, uh, sorry, I thought I had another slide that highlighted some of the other unique um, presentations that we see, I don't. In terms of people who are using them and may or may not be ready or able to use, uh, to, to, to cease, cease or cut down their use, we would talk in terms of harm reduction. We talk about um, mixing, uh, sorry, mulling up 
synthetic cannabinoids as soon as you get them. Um, normally, we would never recommend um, mulling up with tobacco because of the high risk, you know, the harms associated with tobacco. But with these substances, we would certainly recommend to mix them up if it's not with tobacco, with other herbal um, substances, uh, to mix it evenly before using any, to take a very, very tiny dose, you know, as small as a match head if possible, to test the dose and, 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 and feel, um, test out the effects. Um, could help gauge its strength. We would really strongly recommend against not using them in bongs because um, that, that seems to be associated with increased risk of overdose or bad reactions that people, um, people are experiencing. Absolutely no one with a known mental health issue or existing cardiac problems should be strongly advised against using these substances, um, which obviously isn't always possible. Um, and with people who are presenting to emergency departments, look, it's probably really important to point out that most people who experience quite severe acute effects do typically result with symptomatic care and realistically in a clinical setting you would be managing the symptoms um, and that might just be giving them fluids, um, chilling them out with benzodiazepines and anti-emetics, um, anti-nauseous or nausea drugs and most people don't require inpatient care but those who do have presented with things as serious as stroke, seizure and serious cardiovascular issues. So there's a really um, high risk. And in New Zealand, there's been a public health crisis declared with these substances. They've seen 70 deaths associated with synthetic cannabinoids in the last two to three years. Um, so we really want to try and get people away from using them if at all possible, um, which I guess can be specifically tricky in regional areas where people might be doing fly in, fly out type work and subject to drug testing. But really we would recommend if you want to a kind of uh, you know a cannabis type effect that if you can use cannabis instead it's actually far safer um, another class of substances that we tend to see um, are phenethylamines or some people call them phenethylamines um, they're basically a class of drug with documented psychoactive and stimulant effects drugs like mdma methamphetamine are technically phenethylamines um, we are seeing an emergence of new, new classes in Australia, particularly um, substances that are like 2CB, but slightly different strains, things like 2CE, um, a very, very, very strong um, a hallucinogenic called Enbome. Um, that's probably the most common one that we're seeing in these markets. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about these guys because very few people are seeking these out, um, but we are starting to see them um, either being distributed on blotters and missold or mistaken for LSD, and more recently being um, sold in crystals and powders and using to bulk up, um, uh, bulk up uh, substances that are being sold as things like MDMA. The issue with that is um, drugs like Embome and PMMA are extremely toxic. They're far more potent at much, much, much smaller doses. So if somebody doesn't know what they're taking and they're taking what they expect to be a normal dose of something like MDMA and they're taking these substances, um, they can reach toxic toxicity far quicker. Um, particularly because some of them are slower acting, so they might take a little bit longer to come on. Therefore, people tend to redose, um, and then suddenly, because of the bio bioavailability of these substances, they can have really, really nasty effects quite quickly. Um, so there's a low threshold for these substances. So even though cohorts presenting to AOD services may not be using them regularly, there is that high risk of, of unintentional use. Um, also, because of the bioavailability of things like PMA, PMMA, and specifically um, this one class, Enbome, we tend to see that if people snort them, they have a far stronger and much more intense and much longer lasting effect. And I'm talking about really, really intense um, hallucinogenic effects. Um, and increased risks of seizures and serotonin syndrome if these drugs are taken, because they are, they tend to be um, serotonergic drugs that are acting on 
<clears throat> excuse me, serotonin. Um, the implications of that is this high risk of really just acute toxicity. Um, certainly in Melbourne, what we saw uh, not that long ago, um, where 20 people were hospitalised buying substances in one nightclub. Of those 20 people, three people died, and it turned out that they actually were capsules that were sold as MDMA um, that had a little bit of MDMA in them, but primarily had uh, this NBOM and 4-FMA in them. It turns out the people who ingested them orally had really unpleasant long-lasting effects that were not what they were expecting. Um, but for those who snorted them, the outcomes were far worse. Um, and certainly anecdotally, the word on the street is that the pe three people who experienced fatal overdose had actually snorted the substances. So there's a massive harm reduction message there. Obviously not snorting drugs you don't know. The high risk of toxicity can be really, really high risk. Access to testing would obviously be ideal. Um, with NBOM specifically, there's a, a bit of a catch cry. If it's bitter, it's a spitter because it has a specific um, bitter taste. So that's a strong message to put out to people who may be coming across. And obviously to, um, you know, to crush drugs up and to dab and wait because some of these substances have up to a one and a half, two hour onset. So to wait before redosing. Um, in terms of the risk of serotonin syndrome, it's really important to point out that that risk is, is definitely escalated using drugs like MDMA in conjunction with these potential NPS. Um, for those in the room who might not be familiar with serotonin syndrome, it's basically a group of symptoms that occur um, when there is excess serotonin in the brain and the central nervous system. Body tends to go into shutdown and just cannot um, regulate temperature. So that increased dangerously high body temperature can then escalate to agitation, um, muscle rigidity, sweating, seizures, um, really, really, really um, dangerous, dangerous um, symptoms if, if body temperature is not brought down and managed quickly. And I guess it's probably um, really important to point out that that risk is exacerbated significantly if people are taking drugs like MDMA, but also coming across these new psychoactive substances um, and they're taking things like antidepressant SSRIs, um, the pain medication like tramadol, um, and those sorts of combinations are happening. So again, it's just something to be mindful of and something to be talking about. And certainly some of the hospitalizations we saw um, earlier this year in Victoria, uh, reports are that um, uh, that some of those people who were hospitalised after a festival in Gippsland were in ICU up to 10 weeks with serotonergic syndrome that was sort of off the charts, which is, is quite concerning. How are we going for time? Doing okay. All right. Cathinones, we don't see a lot of cathinones in Australia. These are the ones that you might have heard referred to as things like bath salts. These guys are, you know, chemically structurally, structurally similar to phenethylamines, uh, but have a little bit more of an amphetamine-like effect. Um, they tend to be sold as white powder, yellowish tinge. We really haven't seen a massive surgence of them here in Australia like they have in Europe, probably because we have a thriving methamphetamine scene. Um, um, but they have been around since the mid-2000s. They have really euphoric stimulant effects. Um, obviously, short history of human consumption, again, means we don't really know long-term what the issues are, but like, um, uh, like drugs like methamphetamine, they obviously have a high dependence potential for people who are using them regularly. These tend to be very short-acting um, stimulant drugs. So there's often a very strong desire to redose quite quickly, even though the substance is, um, the substance half-life, sorry, the substance is still in someone's system. So there's that risk of um, quickly reaching a level of, of toxicity. Um, the risks and the short-term and longer-term harms, and like I said, are not dissimilar to what we're familiar with with amphetamines. Um, 
but yeah, they're not particularly common, but there are a couple of um, couple of ones around that we are starting to sort of see pop up more so in the festival scene. Drugs like N-ethylpentalone, which is a very powerful stimulant that sort of starts off having almost like an MDMA effect, uh, but that wears off quite quickly within about half an hour or so. Um, and then there's an extremely strong stimulant effect that lasts for some people are reporting 48 to 72 hours. So people are not sleeping for three days, um, um, potentially have redosed and, and had quite high doses of, of them. Um, and because of that lack of sleep, they're experiencing intense paranoia, agitation, um, and really, really unpleasant effects. Pentalone especially, um, it's a bit of a doozy because it's a serotonergic uh, noradrenaline dopamine reuptake inhibitor. So sort of it's really scrambling people's neurotransmitter uh, baselines. And this one has quite high implications for serotonin syndrome as well. So it's just worth being aware that these bath salts um, are around, even though we're not seeing huge use. It's a bit of a misnomer in the media that there's this, you know, monkey dust, zombie apocalypse. It's it's not really happening here. Uh, but for people who are experiencing harms, they're not particularly pleasant. So in terms of the synthetic opioids, I would expect that most people in the room are pretty aware of the uh, normal harms of opioids, what, the, what an opioid overdose looks like, how to respond. Um, but in terms of what we're talking about, the synthetics, we're talking about opioids that don't specifically derive from opium, morphine or codeine. Um, drugs like fentanyl, pethidine, uh, sorry, fentanyl is certainly the classic or carfentanyl are the ones that we're hearing most of. Um, we have not begun to see the crisis that we're hearing about in America in terms of fentanyl being available on the market, but we are starting to see patterns emerging towards that direction. So we really need to be aware of the risks associated. Um, fentanyl is 50 to 100 times more potent than heroin and 200 to 500 times more rapidly absorbed than morphine. So you've got this really, really fast absorption and much more stronger effect. If that little image that's up in the top corner of the screen is a really nice depiction in terms of to get a similar effect between a heroin dose, a fentanyl dose, and then carfentanyl, which really only requires a couple of grains. Um, In terms of availability and use in Australia, most of the fentanyl that we see being used is not illicitly imported in fentanyl. It tends to be through diverted patches and prescribed fentanyl. Um, use is relatively small compared to, uh, compared to heroin, obviously, and other opioids. Um, that being said, detection of fentanyl, certainly at the Sydney injecting facility, um, has increased sort of significantly in the last th three to five years. Um, there is uh, stats out there to suggest that fentanyl is responsible for roughly about 8% of the overdoses that they've seen at the MSIC in Sydney. Overdose is definitely twice as likely for fentanyl users compared to heroin users. Um, and eight times more likely to experience an overdose if injecting fentanyl than say someone who would be injecting other pharmaceutical opioids. So it's a legitimate concern um, and something that we really need to watch out for. Pharmacologically, naloxone definitely works for fentanyl overdose. There is some data emerging or some research emerging to suggest that higher doses of naloxone might be needed because of its strong and faster acting effects. Um, in terms of using naloxone to reverse an opioid overdose, you know, you might have 30 to 45 minutes to respond to somebody who's experiencing an overdose associated with pharmaceutical opioids or heroin. With fentanyl, you may only have minutes so having people aware and carrying naloxone or access, um, access to it is really, really critical and something we really need to be talking to our clients about if possible. 
Um, there's evidence to suggest that failure to reverse fentanyl overdoses is, tends to be associated with the time of administration and or the dose, um, but we really need to sort of um, do a lot more research in that domain. But ultimately, the shorter onset of action means that there's less time to intervene. Otherwise, you're responding as you would normally to, um, to any opioid toxicity. Does anyone have any questions about that? I feel like I sort of skipped over that quite quickly. Yes, we have a question. Um, it's a question as well as a, a um, bit of a, a comment. Um, I concur around the use, particularly in forensic um, patients, um, heavy industry, that, um, that, that are drug tested um, and also um, quite often in people subject to uh, drug testing for child protection. Yeah. Um, but I also, I'd, I'd be really interested to see whether the trends for, for usage go down with the, the more liberal um, drug laws that are starting in America, Canada, parts of Europe. Um, so say cannabis, for instance, um, with the legalisation in all but 11 states in America, full, full uh, legalisation in Canada, etc. Uh, that's not, I mean, a synthetic cannabis, cannabinoid isn't something that someone would normally go for over the, um, <clears throat> cannabis itself. No, you're absolutely right. Like when people are asked directly, which do you prefer? Most people prefer cannabis. Um, there's always, you know, a few psychonauts out there who are out to experience new effects, um, but they're probably not the people who are experiencing harm. You're absolutely spot on. People want to use cannabis, but people tend to um, use these substances because they're there, because they're accessible, or to avoid some kind of detection. Prohibition's a massive issue. I mean, um, uh, the role of prohibition in terms of the Psychoactive Substances Act instantly assumes that psychoactive equates to harm, which we know isn't always the case. Um, we've definitely seen, and I'd imagine you're right, in terms of where we're seeing legalisation of cannabis, we're likely to see a drop in these synthetic substances even being available because there won't be as much of a market for them. Um, so yeah, it, it, it will be interesting. Unfortunately, we just don't have great data on them here in Australia. So that's sort of our first port of call is to get better data collection and monitoring systems so we know what's out there and we're actually talking to people about what they're using. So I'd certainly advocate having more open conversations bringing up these subjects. And uh, I'm sorry, I don't no, you're right. I don't want to take over, but it's also been left to users themselves to organise harm minimisation, networking. I mean, I regularly go on to Pill Report, um, Blue Light RU, uh, Elroyd. Um, so Pill Report, for example, um, there will be on there when, say, um, P, uh, PMMA is picked up in a, a testing either by um, a user or by Victoria Police Labs, Sydney Police Labs, and they will put warnings up there that, mm. you know, the orange Toyota at the moment has PPMA. So, yes. So, so that's... We have, we're not testing at festivals, etc. cetera. We're, we're getting the information. That information's going out almost underground. 
There's a lot of underground testing going on. There's a lot of um, experienced people who are using reagent testing, which are, um, you know, the very rudimentary tests. The issue with um, pill reports is amazing. Blue light are amazing. Um, they're really fantastic resources. There's a couple of caveats that go with using them, though. One is just because the red Superman in Wangaratta has tested positive to PMMA doesn't necessarily mean that the red supermans I've got sitting here about to take with my mates are going to be the same batch. Um, also, with reagent testing, certainly the substances that cause the hospitalisations in Chapel Street in Melbourne and three deaths, um, those particular capsules had a tiny amount of MDMA, the only, uh, and they tested positive for MDMA with a reagent test, but a reagent test wasn't able to pick up the envome and the 4FA that was in them. Um, so there's still a risk, but that being said, most of the people who are uploading information to those kind of websites are pretty experienced and know what they're doing. Um, the other issue is there's great police forensic data, but it's not publicly available. It's, it's almost like pulling teeth, getting that information out. So that's kind of one way to advocate for, for health and safety rather than leaving it up to the users. But tons of underground stuff going on at the moment. And there's a, there is a movement to change that you know, globally, I think. Um, yeah. Did anyone else want to comment before we push on? I'm just a little bit mindful of not taking up too much of your time. We're good. No questions. No questions? Yep. All right. I'll push on. What I might do is I might um, skip over ketamine and GH. B, happy to answer questions offline about these two. The only thing about ketamine I will point out is we have seen a really interesting leap in ketamine use, particularly in Victoria, particularly in Melbourne, um, in the last 12 months. So the EDRS, the regular ecstasy users, um, data that gets um, collected annually has seen a jump from um, about 10 to 35 percent of people who are out using stimulants regularly, um, a jump from about 10 to 35 percent of them using ketamine to 90 percent across Victoria. So we've seen a big shift. So that's something to be mindful of, whether it's related to drug driving, whether it's related to big batches arriving on shore, we don't know. Um, but there's certainly been a change in terms of ketamine's availability. Um, and for GHB, it's often considered a party drug um, and it's not anymore. It's really not limited to festival club, pe club users. Um, yeah, we've certainly seen, um, you know, a very high resurgence of use amongst people who are using methamphetamine. Anecdotally, we sort of originally thought that that was, you know, you'd sort of um, charge for a day or a few days on methamphetamine and people were potentially using GHB at the tail end of that to come down and alleviate the symptoms of the crash or the withdrawal. That doesn't seem to be the case. People seem to be using the two concurrently where if you sort of tweak a little bit too much with methamphetamine, some people are sort of using GHB concurrently to take the edge off and that sort of can go on for, for longer, long periods of time. So just being mindful that there's a shift in terms of what we thought people were using that particular substance for. Um, I'm assuming you guys all know that the dependence potential is really high. People can go into withdrawal within an hour of using GHB if they've been using frequently and regularly. And the withdrawal management needs to be managed in the same way that you'd manage alcohol or benzodiazepine withdrawal. That is, it requires medical management. Um, and certainly turning points, um, uh, new drug and alcohol withdrawal guidelines covers off on that quite comprehensively. So something that um, I just wanted to talk about, we're, we're sort of off the new psychoactives now, all of these sort of research chemicals that we don't know much about. We're into more emerging, emerging patterns of use. Um, something that's been causing a few alarm bells around um, certainly Melbourne and I think Victoria-wide, if not Australia-wide, is pregabalin, Lyrica. Um, initially, it was developed as an anticonvulsant, so it's a central nervous system depressant. Um, so it was used initially as an anti-epileptic agent, but sort of more recently, people have um, been prescribing it quite regularly to treat fibromyalgia and other types of neuropathic pain. So it's being used as a non-opioid analgesic 
to manage chronic pain in certain populations. And we know people who have a history of long-term opioid use often have um, pain management issues, um, lower thresholds for pain. Um, and certainly in Australia, the number of prescriptions has risen dramatically since 2013. Um, and certainly by 2015, um, PBS data suggests that the pregabalin pres prescriptions were among the highest for any drugs. So it is on the PBS. Um, there is a definite growing black market for Lyrica use or pregabalin use in populations, particularly, uh, again, prison populations, forensic populations, where it has been seen as um, a wonder drug to prescribe for pain in preference to opioids. Like opioids 20, 30 years ago, people assumed that if they were being prescribed for legitimate pain that they weren't addictive. We all know that's complete rubbish. Um, people thought the pre-album didn't have a euphoric and, and, and addictive or dependence potential. It does. Um, people tend to use them with other sedatives particularly benzodiazepines, and certainly I've heard incidences of people injecting heroin and taking pregabalin on top to increase the euphoric effect. I've heard it's quite mind-blowing. Um, um, and certainly here at Turning Point, we've seen almost, well, we've, we're seeing, sorry, uh, in terms of risk and harm, Obviously, doubling up on central nervous system um, depressants is problematic for, for obvious reasons. But a new harm that we're seeing is this: um, these high rates of suicidal, suicidal ideation and people attempting suicide. Certainly in the ambulance data that we've been assessing here in Victoria at Turning Point, um, almost 40% of pregabalin or Lyrica misuse related events that required paramedic intervention were actually suicide attempts. So, um, this associated risk of increased suicidal ideation, um, depression is even further exacerbated in people who are using it um, either on label, perfectly as prescribed or off label um, and using it um, non-medically. Um, If we're talking about cohorts of people who already have vulnerabilities to depression and 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 you know um, coping, coping strategy poor coping strategies, then there's a really high risk um, of this this suicidal ideation. Um, so are you guys starting to see Lyrica popping up? Yeah, I'm seeing nods. Yeah, are you talking to clients about its use? I mean, one of the biggest problems is that it's it's prescribed off-label by GPs um, for anxiety. Oh, I haven't heard uh, of that. And old antidepressants. Mm. Um, uh, uh, for the same reason that um, Seroquel was so popular. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> instead of prescribing benzos or... or, or linking someone through counselling. Um, the, the Lyrica has taken over from, from, um, from Seracool. Seracool, yes. Yeah. As, as the anxiety <coughs> off-label drug of choice. It's sort of, it's sort of skyrocketed around 20, 2012, 2013 as this new wonder drug that you know, and 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 it's. I think it's over prescription is a direct result of over prescribing. Anyway, that sort of pill for all ills sort of mentality that we have, and I think that's where um, where we've seen things go significantly pear shaped. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's interesting. It's got a really unique action. It, it's not a GABA receptor agonist. It doesn't inhibit GABA action, but it does in a way. It actually inhibits calcium channel use. So it's got this really unique um, pharmacological effect. Um, but I've certainly heard people, yeah, um, 
sort of horrible reports of really, really nasty side effects. And the other thing with pregabalin that's really important to point out um, is word of, word of mouth has got out, the way it increases intoxication, um, I think especially since other drugs have ended up being more difficult to access because they've either been rescheduled or they've turned up on the safe script. Uh, Lyric is not on safe script, although there is a push, I think, to include it in the next iterations of safe script. Um, but something that's really important is um, um, uh, Dr. Nico Clark, who heads up the injecting facility and has been an addiction medicine specialist for quite some time, um, has pointed out that the withdrawal from this particular medication is is really quite severe as well. And medication, sorry, management of withdrawal is again in line with alcohol or benzodiazepines. So it requires similar strategies in terms of monitoring somebody. Um, the quote is, with pregabalin, a slow, careful tapering off the drug is absolutely required um, or a range of assisting medication. If you suddenly stop use, you might have a seizure or become delirious. Now that is really risky given that if somebody starts having horrible suicidal thoughts and or um, you know, is acting upon those thoughts or thinking about acting upon those thoughts and goes, oh, it's this drug that I'm using and then suddenly stops, there's that risk of seizure and, and, and other side effects in terms of withdrawal. So it's really, it, it is becoming really problematic. And I think the message, I don't know, the message is that we have to sort of um, acknowledge that it's, a really euphoric drug for people who are using it non-medically um, and that you get that it's got this great effect but the risk especially using it in conjunction with you know or opioids or benzos is the risks are really high um, yeah does anyone else want to comment on that one I'm sort of mindful it's a hot topic so you might want to sort of chat a little bit about that further. You mentioned that rescheduling, um, and I'm just interested in if some of that. Re I think you can say something around that, but um, the role, the rescheduling of Alprazolam, for instance, um, is there any sort of data that's coming out that sort of supports maybe that this is the alternative that's being taken up? I think in terms of rescheduling of, of Xanax, Alprazolam, um, I'm not aware of any data. Certainly in terms of safe script, most of the research that I've seen emerging has been more around um, uh, opioid use and or the implications of scheduling codeine and the impact that's had on the broader community. I haven't seen much. I could have a bit of a look and get back to you guys if anything pops up. It's It sort of seems to be the forgotten substance, this Lyrica. It's it's sort of really surprising that it didn't end up on safe script, um, given that it's recently been rescheduled to a Schedule 8 in the UK um, because they have sort of a few years down the track in terms of it emerging and and causing a lot of a lot of harm. So I couldn't answer that really that particularly well. And, and that's... That's an issue when, as a when you're working in withdrawal, um, talking to people, you know, they're, they're coming off a number of other drugs, and I've had several patients that are are on both Seroquel and pregabalin for anxiety from the GP. They're on incredibly high doses of both, but because a prescriber has prescribed it to them, that gives a whole nother facet to, well, it wouldn't be prescribed for me if it wasn't in my best interest. Yeah, I think, I think, um, I mean, I don't want to slam GPs. They've got a really tough gig. They've got to be across a lot of staff, um, but, there is this false sense of safety because prescribers are prescribing substances and it legitimises, like you say, it legitimises consumption. It makes it hard for people to accept the risks that they might 
be experiencing. But we all know that, you know, GPs aren't across everything at all times um, and may not be particularly well informed. And of course, then there's a whole lot of other issues that come into play as well. Um, how do you find those conversations playing out with people? Extremely difficult. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a much bigger systemic issue going on that means GPs need to be educated as well, um, I think. That's not our responsibility, obviously, as people working in the AD sector, but it is to be having those conversations and just getting that message across as effectively as you can. Look, the risk of this is particularly high, um, but we're only just finding out about it and, and we need to let you know. Um, yeah. Um, do you anticipate that it's just going to become more and more of an issue with the pre-gabalin? Because it's only been, has it only been on the PBS for a short period of time? Has it been a while? Um, I think... Uh, eight years, have it? I was just wondering how recent that was, because will it, is it likely to get worse? Or I not? think there's this catch-up. So there's certainly, <laughs> it's a more recent thing that it, you know, words out, it's, it's, um, it's a really great way to increase intoxication, um, but it has been around for a while. Uh, but I think I think we are sort of on the upward turn in terms of, like I said, there's always this lag between new substances being available, new substances being used or used problematically, and then the harms that we start to see. And that that trajectory is going to keep going until you know um, we see some changes, whether that's changes to access, whether that's changes to uh, other substances so that people aren't topping up, whether it's prescribing changes, I think it's a combo of all of that before we'll see, you know, things taper out. There's certainly been a massive spike in ambulance attendances. Frida, I'm just super conscious of time. Um, do, you, do you have a sense of how much longer the presentation might be? Um, I'm pretty much able to wrap up. So all I had was... Um, what we need to do to respond to NPS. So I'm reckoning five-ish minutes. Uh, is that okay with everyone to go for another five? Yeah, cool. No, yeah. all good. Thanks, Rita. Just checking. Cool, cool, cool. cool. Um, so obviously today was about having a conversation about substances, um, continuing that conversation. Certainly we're, after the research we've done, we're advocating for, um, uh, you know, more access to information, better, better data monitoring systems, better um, information dissemination to the sector so that we can be a bit more fluid and dynamic in terms of staying up to date with what's going on and not waiting till we see a whole bunch of harms before um, before responding. Um, I think it's really important, somebody mentioned earlier that, you know, it's often up to the people who are using the using drugs to sort out their own harm reduction and they're actually the experts. They know far more than we do. Um, and so I think it's really important that as a sector we bring together not just clinical experts and the research knowledge, but also the lived experience. Um, we definitely found um, differences in knowledge and opinions between people who worked solely as harm reduction peer support workers versus people working um, in more cl more traditional clinical settings. Um, that's not to say one knowledge is better than the other, but I think there's a, a way to marriage that and, and sort of being mindful of that is really important at a systemic level. Um, in terms of clinically managing and for most cases, most drugs, um, you know, managing withdrawal, usually it's business as usual in terms of your traditional knowledge. So have, have confidence in what you do know and respond to the symptoms that you're seeing. That's the best way forward. And that's certainly what the literature is saying in terms of, of being able to um, respond to new drugs that are available. Um, really important universal harm reduction messaging all the way. Um, and some substance specific harm reduction messaging that I've touched on some of it with you and I'll run through them a bit more specifically. Um, but also, yeah, we need to bring in that harm reduction outside the traditional AOD services because there is a whole cohort of people out there who are coming across different drugs who aren't our typical presenters or they're not presenting to us until, you know, way down the track in terms of their drug using career. So thinking about ways that we can um, get those harm reduction messages out more effectively. 
So specific to NPS, what we're talking about, obviously naloxone, naloxone, naloxone in terms of risk of opioid overdose. If somebody's been using opioids and something like pregabalin, you might administer naloxone. Um, we would always um, recommend somebody may not respond immediately um, because of other drugs on board, whether it's fentanyl, whether it's you know a cocktail like um, pregabalin, benzos and heroin. So always, always, always encourage somebody to contact triple zero if they are using naloxone. Standard universal harm reduction, drug set setting, don't use alone, all of those same messages are equally relevant no matter what drugs we're talking about. Um, in terms of the toxicity of some of the stimulants that we're seeing in the, in the phenethylamines, the, the, the sort of more hallucinogenic style stimulants, start low, go slow. If you don't have access to testing, really, really start with low doses and wait twice as long. We, we say crush, dab, wait is, is something in terms of if people are getting crystals um, or pills, crush them up, disperse them as evenly as possible, dab and wait twice as long as you'd normally wait say if you were you know expecting your MDMA to come on within 30 to 50 minutes wait longer in case it isn't what you thought it was um, in terms of synthetic cannabinoids mull it up mix it evenly don't use bongs definitely don't use alone um, consider route of administration so again not using bongs for synthetic cannabinoids if you can avoid if we can avoid it not snorting something that you haven't been familiar with or, or used before particularly um, particularly in a festival or club setting if it's bitter it's a spitter um, it's one of my favorite ones it's easy to remember and it's a strong suggestion that it's not what you expected it obviously that isn't relevant to people who are using drugs for the first time and naive drug users but it's a good message to have, don't mix and match. These are all just standard. And where possible, use testing kits or services or other types of services like, um, I haven't got drugs report and or blue light up there actually, um, uh, but ERA would look after drugs report. So there's some really good resources to get more information. When we did our research, particularly uh, drug and alcohol workers were most concerned about not knowing much about drug interactions between NPS and other substances. That one we can't answer because we don't have the research in terms of, you know, this myriad of different types of substances and how they work because because the information is not there. They haven't been around long enough. Um, but if you are interested in learning more about drug interactions, one place that you might want to look is, I've got it there, the third on the list, the TRIPSIT drug interaction chart. This is a really cool um, resource that uh, indicates so if you yeah if you if you jump online to that website there you can get a look at this this can be blown up into a large size it's um, really useful in terms of looking at one substance and how it interacts with others and it ranges from absolutely harmful do not mix for example alcohol and almost anything say alcohol and benzodiazepines is a big red X, right through to, oh yeah, these drugs don't necessarily work together, but they don't work against each other. So that's a really great resource. And Tripsit have a little phone app that you can use. And a lot of the newer, the more common newer psychoactive substances are in there. Um, I've just popped up that slide for you guys to show where to go a bit deeper into things than we've been able to go today. Um, one I'd specifically point out is the Neptune Clinical Management of Club Drugs and New Psychoactive Drugs. Um, it's an e-learning module and it will uh, each module hones in on different types of club drugs. Um, and I think it might have a synthetic opioid thing as well in there. Um, that's a really, really great new resource and one of the better NPS resources that exists out there. We're hoping to develop something over the next year or two that would be similar well, the next year or so that'll be similar. Turning points AOD withdrawal guidelines do touch on NPS, but really they touch on them in a way that, you know, we don't have evidence, so we're not 100% sure. Um, and there's a couple of really great webinars that have had a slightly different focus to what we've talked about today. One by Stephen Bright, um, who did, uh, a webinar for the Matilda Centre and a bunch of PHN, Primary Health Network clinicians, um, and NDARC have really popped, recently popped one out um, uh, with Professor Shane Dark, who's done a lot of research into um, 
uh, recent mortalities related to synthetic cannabinoids. So there's some extra resources for you to dig a bit deeper than we've been able to today. I am 100% open for questions. I realised I've rambled quite quickly at you for the last hour or so. Um, but that's pretty much it from me. If you guys wanted to get in touch, my details are there. Naomi's got the slides that I'm happy to be shared with you as a PDF. And if you wanted any more info on anything we've talked about, that's my email address there. Thanks. Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'll definitely uh, make sure these slides get out to everybody. Um, and if there's any like kind of key questions that people have to, to get in touch with you, but also if there's enough collectively, we, we can try and organise another Zoom link up to answer some of those questions as well. I'll just see what the group wants. Yeah, sounds awesome. Um, very wonderful to talk to you guys. I hope you have a great rest of the day. And um, yeah, let us know if you need anything. Thanks so much, Rita. Thanks, guys.